The King of Diamonds, Chad Haggar. Uh, I'm going to excuse the um, uh, audience today that we're going to be conducting our interview uh, in English, uh, but I'm really excited to have Chad Haggar, the King of Diamonds, with us today. Chad, how are you? I'm great. Yeah. Thank you for asking me to be here. I feel like I've known you for a long time, even though we just met a few days ago. I know, and it was even on Zoom. Yeah. Yeah, it, I feel the same, and I'm really, really excited and honored. Uh, this is the first time for this show to be conducted in English, but okay. you're an Egyptian-American. You are I like am. all of our kids uh, that grow up here. Some of them understand very well. I know I tested you a few on a few things, so you passed some of the things, and you failed, and we decided, let's go in English. That would and be And hopefully easier. we will be able to uh, put some captions for some of the audience today. Okay, great. Uh, it's really exciting. Thank you for driving. And uh, we want to tell the audience all about your story. You have a unique uh, story as a businessman, as an Egyptian American, uh, as an immigrant, because you also came to this country, um, you know, at the age of five, your parents, Sabrina, the store, like everything about it. So let's go back all the way to Alexandria, Egypt, and sure. tell me a little bit about your upbringing. And also, how did you come to this country? So I remember little bits and pieces about um, Egypt. Um, I remember my last days when we were leaving and, you know, the ceremony and, and all of the family coming to say bye uh, as we were making our way to Beirut. Because at that time, the way to get out of Egypt was through Beirut. So you had to go there and wait for the paperwork to be done and then transition to wherever you were going to permanently settle. Mm -hmm. So I remember very little parts of it. I remember, you know, certain things in our house. I remember that we had a lot of the things I remember are related to animals mm -hmm. um, because I'm an animal lover and we had a a uh, coop down, downstairs in the, in the yard, mm -hmm. and we raised pigeons and chickens and ducks and things like that. And so, so little tiny life. things about yeah. Egypt and, and um, certain things related to my dad's business where I would go with him. Because I understand your dad was one of the top textile people in the country. I mean, I know yes. uh, you've shown me some of the pictures with him with Sadat, Abdel Nasser, and he yes. was a well-known and unfortunately, Gezaim ibn Ul al Ta'mim. And then um, he decided to start his life here in California. Um, you know, there is something interesting about the story of your mo mother, Loris Rabbana Yirhamha. Um, someone told me about her and they then later connected um, me to you. And the, the moment they told me about Loris and the supermarket or the Middle Eastern Egyptian restaurant that she um, opened down in downtown L.A., every time I think about Loris, I think that she's my mom. <laughs> she and and later you told me that she's everybody's mom. I can yes. just vi visualize this woman, yeah. uh, literally just cooking for everyone. It was, I mean, Sabrina was more than a supermarket or uh, or a restaurant. It was really a community hub. Very much so. Yeah. yeah. So tell me a little bit about your mom, this beautiful <coughs> woman that I feel like I missed out on actually meeting her in person. So my mom came to this country, uh, like many other immigrant women at the time never having worked a day in her life mm. and of course uh, when they came to Los Angeles it you know basically all the families required dual incomes right so uh, she started working at a local nursery mm. uh, little children and she was um, she was just helping with the kids and then uh, several years later I believe it was in 73, uh, she bought a little grocery store mm. uh, with, of course, my dad's help. And it was a grocery store that was like the only one around. And they decided, she decided to uh, turn it into Middle Eastern food. Mm. And so she started with this business. Um, there was a small community of Egyptians at the time yeah. uh, that expanded greatly over the years when pe more people started to immigrate. But then it became much more than that. It became kind of a community center for 
everyone from the Middle East. So, so all the Arab come in, you said. All like the Arabs, students, absolutely, and, yeah. sure. You know, kids that would, would come here to study at UCLA or UC, USC that miss their home, you know, their, their own food, their mother's cooking. Mm. So it wasn't just a supermarket as much as it was like an everything store because mm. it was a delicatessen and it was a restaurant mm. and it was uh, Middle Eastern foods, canned, frozen, fresh foods. Right. And so people went there to reconnect with their culture. Mm. And so in many ways, um, these people had left their parents, had left everything behind. And my mother became a surrogate mom to so many people that, that were here for college or had just, you know, come mm. to start a new life. And uh, this was a place that they came to reconnect with their food, but mm. also with other people. Yes. And, you know, friendships were made and relationships were made and marriages were made out of... But you were pretty, Sabrina. I mean, as much as I know you, you told me that later in your life you became everybody's dad, but you were pretty upset at that time or, or just looking at your mom being everybody's mom. You were, as a child, I mean, as, a, as kids, we're all selfish. You know, that's, a, that's, that's an interesting question. I don't know that, that it was that I was resentful of her role mm. as being everybody's mom as much as it was that in those days, and probably even today, um, the food business is brutal. Mm. It's a very tough business, and it was a seven-day-a-week business. Right. So what happened was that when we first came to America, and it was in the late 60s, and you know there was these few years where it was just the perfect family life because my dad yes. had a normal job and right. my mom had a normal job, and so they were off on the weekends, and mm. you know we would we would re you know, reconnect with other families and go to Magic Mountain, which is Six Flags right, now. Right, we'd right. go to the beach or we'd go to parks. Life. And yeah. so the day that store opened, and both of my parents at that time were entrepreneurs, mm. that's the day our family life completely changed. So mm. it wasn't that I didn't love her role as everybody's mom. It's that she was a working mom. Mm. And it wasn't a five day a week job, it was a seven day a week job. So, yeah. you know, having those first few years of living that perfect family life and then changing to where every time I would leave school, I would go straight back to the store, right. basically do my homework and then start working. Yeah. And so we How all became employees. Affect, I feel like, you know, just listening to, you, to this story even one more time now is, you know, makes me think you chose what you ended up doing in life and also focusing on making money from a young age was was part because you saw the hard work and a lot the, a lot of the hard work and the time and the effort and the hours they had to put away from the family which all of us have to do at some sure. point of our lives um Absolutely. Uh, but but you probably learn a lot just from being as you said a cashier or back you know washing dishes uh, or but but witnessing all the family time that had to go away because of this business. So tell me a little bit about Chad as you're growing up, witnessing all of this, making community connections, but also being, what can I do to my life so not so I'm not in that situation later? That's that's a great question, because interestingly enough, having grown up with two parents that were entrepreneurs. I did not want to be an entrepreneur mm. initially. So what I did is I went into the corporate world. Right. And I stayed in that corporate world for 20 years. Interestingly, I can't say that I worked less because I was so driven mm. that in many cases I was working six and seven days a week right. to make a name for myself. So not that I worked less, but I worked more securely mm. and having that pathway of being in a corporation knowing that you're always going to get a paycheck that it's not going to be up and down that there's very you know there's a consistency right to your income gave me a certain amount of safety mm. that i didn't necessarily get from my childhood because you know when both of your parents are in business right there's years that are bad sure and there's years that are good and there's more years that are bad. Right. And so I, I didn't really want 
to have my children experience that same roller coaster ride. Mm. I wanted safety and I wanted security. And then what I learned is how to run businesses mm. the American way. I see. I, I mean, that's you're actually bringing up something that should have been a little bit later in the conversation. But since we're talking a little bit about your career now, um, I mean, I'm reminded of, of a book that we, we both love, you know, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Robert yes. Kiyosaki. I mean, he's this Hawaiian businessman giant, um, you know, jack of all trades. He's done pretty much everything in his life. Um, and But you've learned early on in your life uh, that concept of passive income. We haven't really discussed in this show before mm -hmm. in depth, um, you know, wealth and, and, you know, the economy and all that stuff, but at least... If you can touch base a little bit on this, because you started that concept of base passive income early on, because you ended up owning, mashallah, like you know some of the largest storage, um, you know, air, storage businesses in the U.S. Yes. Um, so you started that early on, and you actually started some trade shows because you ended up being in the jewelry industry at the age of 19. So explain what how was what was your thought process at 19 years old? <sighs> So I knew that um, a lot of the greatest wealth stories in America were related to real estate. Mm. And so I, I knew early on that that was something that I was definitely going to do. And I'd witnessed it from watching several of my uncles within the family. Um, build pretty, you know, big empires of, uh, of real estate businesses. So while I didn't go into the real estate business, I chose to be, a, you know, a corporate guy and I went into the jewelry business, mm. um, climbed my way through there. What I did is that I continued to save mm. and every time I had the ability, I would parlay that savings into some kind of real estate investment. Mm. I started out very small, just buying single family homes. Mm. And then uh, the single family homes, you know, became apartment buildings. And then the apartment buildings became shopping centers. Right. And then um, I found a niche for myself, which I seemed to really be good at. And that was the self storage business. Mm. And so over the years, I've kind of transitioned all of those real estate investments which I made in my early years into the storage business and mm. now we operate I believe you know we're in the top 50 in the country Mashallah, yeah so this is a smart idea because I mean I was listening to to one of Robert's speeches this uh, you know as I was driving here a lot of people are scared they're scared to get into this um, and and you made it really early but one of the other things that you told me is that you also decided to move out early and talk to anyone who's Egyptian about their kids moving out at 18 or 19 tell us what your dad said <laughs> <laughs> yeah so I decided when I was 19 and by the way this had never been done in my family I mean and mm. by that time by the time I was 19 there was probably a hundred of our family members living in Southern California. But at the age of 19, I went to my parents and I told them, I want to move out. Mm. And my father looked at me and he said, okay, if you move out, don't come back and don't ever ask me for money. Typical and Egyptian said, father. <laughs> okay, that's a deal. Yeah. So, Chad, do you think moving out was a sign of you being just a rebel? You want to rebel against, you know, the norm, against the culture? Did you struggle as a kid, you know, moving, you know, at five? Uh, you know, how you looked, how the society looked, how the society looked at you? Was that really the main reason? Or why did you just move out? So, it's that's a very interesting question. So, I can tell you that when we came to L.A. in the late 60s, um, there was quite a few families, but the majority of the children were actually my sister, my sister's age. Mm. So they were three to four years older than me. When I went to school, there was me and one other Egyptian girl. Unfortunately, our parents knew each other, so we were introduced mm. prior to, to going to school on the first day. Nice. 
Uh, and, you know, being one of two Egyptians in an entire school of no other people from the Middle East, mm. you know, we had obviously some Latino people and there's a big community of Japanese uh, people because we were close to little, little Tokyo mm -hmm. on Sotel, but everybody else was Anglo. Mm. And so, sure, you feel different. And, you know, part of the first experiences I had of being different was taking our school lunches mm. and taking out a pita bread sandwich when nobody had ever seen a pita bread. Wow, can you eat a fool or what? <laughs> no, I mean, I don't even remember cook. what, just what it would have. It's just the bread. fact that it was pita bread. It was like, wow. what is that? You know, people would ask you, what is that? Wow. I'm like, it's, it's our bread. And but see, the society have changed a lot. Completely. Chad, I mean, now pita bread is in every single market. Absolutely. There and was people are not encouraged. a single, I mean, there was like one or two places in all of Los Angeles that you could get Middle Eastern food before my mother opened that store on the wow. west side. There was no stores on the west side. You'd have to go to an Armenian store in Hollywood mm. to find food. So sure, yeah. you, identi you, you feel different. Mm. Um, of course, I always knew I was from a special place. Mm. So I was always proud right. of the heritage. But as for your other question, was I a rebel? Absolutely. Hmm. Uh, I, I definitely was a rebellious kid. Hmm. Do we have to be scared? Because, you know, a lot of the people that watch us and continue to watch us, and I personally have teenagers, when our teenage boys, especially in this country, I know, you know, being a, being a, a, a teenage boy in this country is very different than being a, a teenage girl. There's a lot of pressure. There's that, you know, masculinity. There's all kinds of things that go through your head that I don't even know and I never experienced high school in America so I can't really understand the struggle uh, that's a struggle it is a struggle middle as far school as I and understand. high school is, a tr is, a, is the biggest struggle yeah and this is so when one of our kids come over to, to us and say we want to move out and start our, uh, and start our life how how should we react embrace it hmm. embrace it because I will tell you that it built my character mm. very early on. And it is, it's, it's a part of this culture being in America to experience hardships and experience challenges and learn responsibility earlier than we in the Egyptian com community impose upon our kids. Mm. We shelter them, we, you know, we coddle them. And I, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm saying that from my experience, it was a very good thing. Mm. Being on my own, learning how to be responsible for making my own phone bill, uh, paying my own utility bills, having my own rent mm. uh, to pay, being responsible, learning how to manage money, right. not having to run to my parents every time I had a challenge, that built my character. It made me stronger. It made me wiser, faster. Mm. And why did you pick the, the jewelry industry? I mean, you ended up specializing in diamonds, but why the jewelry industry from early on? That was really just a fluke. And mm. I was doing jewelry early on uh, to make ends meet because I put myself through college. Mm. And so I was um, selling jewelry to make extra money. Mm. And then in my final few years of college, because I worked full-time as I was going to school, mostly full-time. Mm. Um, I went to work for a company called Zale, which mm -hmm. is, you know, one well of the known. biggest in the country. Right. I didn't intend to stay in the, in the jewelry business. I thought I would probably go on to work for the State Department. I was very interested oh. in things like that. Okay. Um, but in that year that I graduated from university, the district manager of the company came and approached me and said, we don't want you to leave. Mm. We're very impressed with what you've done and we'd like to offer your store manager position. So I thought, you know, I might as well give it a shot. Mm. So that trial ended up being my career for mm. 20 years because that, that opportunity to become a store manager straight out of university I got my name out there. Hmm. Um, fortunately, it's a small I was, industry, right? It's not like it's a, a very small interest yeah. industry. It's very um, incestuous, hmm. and uh, and because jewelry is based on trust, hmm. 
So if you're entrusted with managing a store and you build a reputation of success and, res and responsibility, mm. responsibility for the inventory sure. that you're being given to manage because Absolutely. it's in the millions. For sure. And so I was a, you know, a 20 year old and early you know, 22 or 23, I think I was, uh, charged with managing, you know, a multi-million dollar inventory. Mm. And uh, fortunately, I, I had a successful year. And then that same year, I was recruited by a company that was expanding into Southern California. They were looking for people that, uh, you know, had a reputation in the market. Mm. I don't know how I got a reputation, but it's hard I was work. fortunate enough. It's hard yeah, work. Yep. I think it's, it's the fact that you, I mean, sometimes when you're on your own, you're actually scared and you want to make your parents and your family proud, right? You're like, there's no you're question on your own, about that. Right. The but, fear, the fear of failure hmm. is a big motivator, I right? I see. Yeah. Not wanting to go back to my dad to right, say, right. I need help. Hmm. So that propels you into hard work. And of course I already have that ethic. I think it's within our culture, right? Our culture has an ethic of hard work right. built in right every you know i think every one of our parents teaches us mm -hmm. to work hard to do good in school to right. you know all but sometimes the our parents or us us parents they have a specific path for their kids most of our kids end up taking another path sure how did your dad accept that and and your mom too <sighs> mm. i don't think i was ever questioned about you know, why are you working in jewelry or hmm. things like that? Sure, I think my dad maybe had it in the back of his mind that he hoped that I would go into the businesses that they had built. Mm -hmm. I, I had no interest in doing that whatsoever. Mm. I didn't want to be in the food business. Right. And I didn't want to be in my, my father's. At you that time, he was doing import own. and export. Yeah, you wanted to create your own, you know, like who Chad is. I'm going to ask you a sensitive question. We don't talk a lot about this in, in our community. Okay. I mean, mashallah, you know, you ended up being a successful businessman and we're still, you know, continuing the conversation. But did your dad ever come over and say, I'm proud of you, son, just like as we see <laughs> all those white men go, we tab tab ala kitf, uh, you know, home, like, I'm proud of you, son. I love you, no, son. Hmm. He did not. Yeah. That, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very interesting question. And I'm sure you hit on a on a spot that mm. most Egyptian men with their fathers have that same. Right. There was this one instance in my life, which is very, it's just an oddball thing, but we were all in Egypt mm. and my father, we were staying at the, at the Marriott mm -hmm. on the Omar Nile. Yes, I love yeah. it. It's a beautiful place. And so my dad took this picture in front of this magnificent uh, facade mm -hmm. and it was a professional picture. And when he came back to LA, he signed the back of it. Mm. Uh, I'm proud of you. Mm. To you my son, I'm proud of you. Did you celebrate? I'm sure you were jumping up and down. I was, you know, it was like, wow, finally, finally, <laughs> finally I he, get you something good. You can be good. like a millionaire, but there's still, for some reason, <laughs> Why do you think it's so hard for us to express our emotions? I have emotions? no idea. Yeah, because I, you I, know, I, I was know sharing it. with you, you know, my, my kids were born and raised here. And every time my son, especially my older son, calls me, he does not end the call without saying, I love you. And of course, I love him unconditionally and my all oh, my kids, and I'm sure you do the same. But it was hard for me to say it in the beginning because it wasn't ingrained in me. I mean, he kind of forced me. He taught me how to say this, how yep. to express my emotions to him and to my kids but i always wonder why are not re why aren't we really good about expressing i don't know i can tell you my mother never said it either hmm. my mother never said i love you right. it's just but i knew showed. she did yeah I, there's no question right and and i it's it's interesting i may have mentioned this to you before she was eternally proud hmm. of my accomplishments but hardly ever told me that hmm. she would tell other people yeah. Oh, she would tell her sister. So she would tell. I'm like, Chad did this. Sure. Chad yes. That. You yeah. know, so, so a very typical. You know, it's interesting mom. as, you know, when she, when she passed, which was, uh, you know, a tough time, very tough time. Of course. Um, 
I, I heard a lot of those stories come out. And she, you know, people would come to me saying, she, you were the light of her life. You were mm. the apple of, you know, I mean, it, she would just, she was, ev you were everything to her. Mm. And despite the fact that you kind of, I mean, you left the home, you did your thing, you grew, mashallah, in your career, and you kind of, you know, you swayed away from the culture a little bit. You even shared with me, like, you know, back in the day, uh, your family was actually very instrumental in um, creating or building one of the very first Coptic churches in sure. LA. Yes. It's a beautiful church. I've been there before. <laughs> and Kunti Shames, I've seen pictures of you yes, as a Shames. Yep. But, but just like, pretty much the journey of everybody with faith and God. You kind of drifted away a little bit, and especially college in America. I mean, I work for university, and, and I see all the parties and the fraternities, and, and the pressure on kids to be mainstreamed is really hard. But what I was telling somebody yesterday as I was reflecting on your story, instill that faith early on, because you know they come back full circle because that's exactly what that's, happened to that's you. very true and yes when we first came to la there was no coptic church mm. so I, I if i remember correctly we used to go to a syrian orthodox church mm. in hollywood because that was the closest sure. thing to our culture right and i i don't know how many families there were at the time but very early in the 70s we all pooled you know, as much money as we could to buy that church in, mm. on Robertson, which is the first right. Orthodox church yep. in Southern, in California, I think. Yep, yep, yeah. And it's, it's still, it's still, every time I go by that church, right. it, you know, I have such a complete uh, connection with it. Mm. You know, when I've been there for whatever it is, whether it's funerals or, or weddings recently, it's it still feels like a part of me. There's no question yeah. about it. But then, of course, when you go to through the higher education in America. Mm. There's no question that the curriculum pulls you away from God. Mm. It does. It's a, it's a very liberal-minded mm. um, curriculum, especially the Cal State system. Mm. And, and many other, even private universities are, you know, a lot of the professors do it I don't know if it's intentional or not, mm. but they do make you question everything and you start right. to question everything yourself and you do inevitably. Uh, some of us did kind of veer off mm. away from the church and then you do come back full circle. And you, right. I think it's having children mm. is a big part of that because as soon as I had kids, I started taking them to church and, mm. and reconnecting. So you, so you think that the way back to God was because of your kids? I think so. Yeah, that's a, that's a beautiful way of yeah. thinking about it. I would never say I felt unchristian right. or not right. a Christian or right. not a Coptic right. Egyptian, but you just kind of, you know, I, I would say I distanced myself mm from it for a while for a while even i mean you told me even when you got married you did not marry in the coptic church and that was a little bit of a disappointment to your mom it was yeah i think it broke her heart yeah but again a little bit my of my rebellious streak yes. i i married a non-egyptian hmm. uh, she's christian right uh but she was not coptic, coptic and i yes. didn't want to have her go through that whole process hmm. of you know, the conversion. It's right. not easy. Right. And, and I, you know, I think if I would have asked or insisted, I'm sure she would have done it. Sure. But I didn't. Mm. And did it hurt my family? I, I'm sure it did. But, but Do then, I regret it? Probably, yes. Mm. I, I would say yes, it would have been the right thing to do. Mm. And I would encourage everybody that can uh, stick to their their faith mm. their historical roots that they should that's a that's actually an amazing advice because we talk a lot about marriage and divorce and i know you had a a beautiful marriage story that unfortunately ended up in, in separation and i know you would like to to talk a little bit about this but that's i mean that's why when we tell our kids you know marry within the culture marry within the religion we're not trying to be close-minded we're trying to explain to them from experience that marriage is already a hard thing. It is. It's a hard journey. So would you allow us to talk a little bit about that? Sure, sure. I will say I don't have any regrets. Mm -hmm. 
That's great. About having married who I did mm. and spending 25 very loving and successful years of my life with, uh, you know, with Cynthia. Her mm. name is Cynthia. Um, but there's challenges. Mm. There's cultural challenges and there's, there's a heavy weight on that other person mm. that's not of your culture. Right. Because our culture is all consuming. Yeah, very dominant. It's, there, there's no question about right. which one will take over. Mm. And we have a strong culture. We have a very rich heritage, a very prideful history. Yes. And inevitably, it ends up overpowering mm. any other culture, right. especially if, and who, it's not even an if, the simple fact that the family mm. is so involved in every part right. of your life uh, makes it... Uh, it's not even a competition. And Chad, you're also so Egyptian. I mean, some of the, uh, the pictures that we're going to show about some of the family uh, parties that you host in your home, those, sure. you know, mashallah, 100 family members that, you know, ended up coming here. They have, you know, the, the other family members and their the cousins. And you shared with me all those parties that you actually host at your home. You're so Egyptian. I'm 100% Egyptian. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, even though you were technically raised you were yes. raised here so i'm sure your culture was actually very dominant one of the other things that you shared with me is that your mom would would call you and say kallim tante fulena kallim tante de kaza there's a funeral here and there there's this and that and you were always hadir yes i would of do course it because she's of course. your mom and you have so that obligation even with what i described as rebellious mm. with in rebellion, there's still no denying the respect that I have for what my parents are, what mm. they meant to the community, um, and what my family meant to me. Mm. And so those calls, and they're unrelenting. Right. You know, she's not going to let up. Mm. So I knew if I didn't make the phone call, she was going to call She's to follow call up. Again. Yeah. I mean, there was there there is a cultural. It's you know, it's called al usul, right? Mm -hmm. usul. Whatever's yes. whatever you have yes. to do, that's yes. what you got to do. Absolutely. And so yes, I I knew that if she called me to say so and so is in the hospital, you need to call. I was going to call. Mm -hmm. So and so. Uh, uncle passed away who I'd never even seen, right, yes. you know, we're going to need to send flowers or one of us has to go to the funeral. Right. Well, by all means, I was yeah. going to do one or the other. Right. Yeah. And so, um, it's, and you were uh, happily taking over all of this, you know, taking the sure. role of being that person who's hosting, who's always welcoming, but that, and it's also because I grew up that way. Mm. I grew up with a very open house, right? My, our family, our house was always full. It was always full of people. Mm. They were coming and going and eating and, you know, and then Sabrina was like, you know, the community center. Sure, yeah. So it was ingrained in my, in my lifestyle yeah. from the very beginning. Did I veer off from that for a while? Yeah, I'm sure. During mm. college years, I mean, right. I wasn't doing any of that stuff right, because, right. you know, you're living in your own world. Sure, yeah. But then when you become a family person, and then especially after my father passed away, yes. you know, you have the weight of that. Yeah, it's like, sure. okay, it's time for me to step time up to me. the plate here and take on yeah. the responsibility. But you're also a very, I mean, I want to shift back a little bit about your business and, you know, being in the jewelry industry for 20 plus years, also managing those, you know, storage, um, you know, places all over the country. And then also you have your two companies now, mashallah, you're, that you're, you know, building and continue to go. I mean, you, you told me like the other day, like I go to work every day. So I do. you yeah. love what you're doing, yes. even though you've created some, you know, passive incomes to yourself but um, despite of all of this busyness you're so dedicated to your family uh, but also I wanted to talk a little bit about the fact that this business puts you in situations and made you meet a lot of people that we call like famous people VIPs you know sure. you said something about Elton John uh, you know you meet you meet many many people 
that you haven't necessarily met in your like in your whole life. I mean, I shared with you when I started my work at Chapman University in the fundraising department, I got to meet millionaires and billionaires. My family wasn't a millionaire. Um, so we kind of have to kind of fake it till you make it kind of a deal once you <laughs> are put in those situations. Yeah, Egyptians are smart. They know how to charm a room. I know you've had those skills, I'm sure. But how can wealth be intimidating, um, you know, to you and to others? How can wealth be intimidating? I've never been intimidated by wealth. Mm. I will say this. I am a firm believer that education gives you that backbone mm. to stand and talk and speak and listen with just about anybody. Mm. And so I've never been intimidated by people that are wealthier than me. Um, and I don't feel uh, any, any sort of intimidation today, mm. uh, whether I'm talking to a billionaire or a movie star or anybody else, because at the end of the day, we're all just people. Mm. People with, you know, different circumstances and uh, different life experiences, and they're all interesting. Mm. All those experiences me, are interesting. You told me, give me an advice the other day. Don't, don't start getting into, you know, get buying the luxuries until you have, you know, the passive income and, you know, build a business and, and all that stuff. And that's what you did. And one of the luxuries that you have in your life is that beautiful ranch in Palm Springs. <laughs> yeah. uh, you fell in love with horses. I mean, I know you're an animal lover. Uh, so you fell in love with horses when you went to Egypt and rode that horse. And since then, you just, you know, you bought a whole ranch and yeah. you have. Tell, tell me about horses. So, yeah, and that, what that's does a great story. Yeah. The first time I went to Egypt, um, after we immigrated, right. it, I was 18. Mm. I was 18 years old. I went to Egypt not having known any of my cousins, of which I have, you know, so many. Sure, yes. There were two that were by my side all the time. Uh, one was Wa'il and mm. the other one was Rafit. Mm. And every time, that first time that I went to Egypt and every time subsequently, they were always there to basically do anything uh, I wanted to do, any, any sure. place that I wanted to see. And so I wanted to ride horses around the pyramids. I didn't want to go and ride a camel. I didn't want to do all that touristy Just stuff. Horses. And so they took me to a private stable mm. and they, they knew the owner. Mm. And we got three horses and went out for a ride. And I was hooked. Hmm. It was exhilarating. First of all, just the fact of being in the desert, looking at the pyramids and the right. Sphinx on a horse is such an incredible experience. Right. But then I came back and um, I still had that love for that experience and I wanted to experience it again. So I ended up getting a horse at my first opportunity, which is the first big luxury that I ever had. Hmm. And I was, I think, 20 two or 23 years old but it ended up being an incredible success mm -hmm. to have that horse because it connected me I, I my horse was at the la equestrian center mm. and so amongst those people and i right. fortunately i was in a company at that time zales mm -hmm. i was working for a, a, the higher end of the Zales stores, it was a company called uh slavics which was part of bailey banks and mm -hmm. biddle and we sold rolexes mm. And so every equestrian person in sure. the world knows that the most indestructible watch is a Rolex. So right. if you own a horse, you have to get a Rolex. So mm. I was amongst all these people that were horse owners or horse lovers. And it was, it was a great benefit to me because I was introduced to all these people. Yeah. And then they would ask me what I did and I would tell them. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm looking for so-and-so. Well, my store is, you know, right down the right. street. Chad, you just see you just see an opportunity in everything. I mean, I, lo I, mean, I love talking to you because I feel like just there's always business ideas. And despite the fact that maybe you have bought this horse for entertainment or the love of the animal, but but also you kind of found a way it worked. around it worked. Uh, you yeah. know, and uh, around, you know, using it for your business, which is amazing. Same with 
الحمام oh, yeah. I know this is a little secret not a lot of people know about you but I need to make this public because I think we have a connection here to the biggest uh, hamem person in Orange County or like in Southern California. I don't know, in if, California, it's in, yeah. uh, if, I don't yeah. know if it's in, in the whole U.S., but at least in California, which where we are right now. Um, I know you love animals and you love al hamem as animals, but you also decided because of our love al hamem bil mulukhiyya wal fariq and all that stuff. <laughs> and I know especially <laughs> in the church there was a huge demand. And then later sure, yes. you also worked with all the halal you know guys yeah, yeah. that's an amazing business story cultural story there's just a lot of mix that i really just want to want the secret to be out so tell us yeah so so i i mentioned to you my my memories in egypt of that little loft that we had downstairs where we had we had we were going pigeons and things like right. that but there's also another backstory to that one of my dad's businesses he had this restaurant in Alexandria, it was called Borg al Hamam. Mm. And that was when I mentioned that I would go with my dad to, that was the place that I always wanted to go. Oh, because okay. they had, they had, they served pigeons, they right. served Hamam. Mm -hmm. And there was this, it was this beautiful restaurant in Alexandria and there was always like live pigeons in the back. Sure. So I would always want to go because I would, you know, go and play with the pigeons and go and hang out there. Mm -hmm. But years later, um, I had opportunities to raise animals and things like that. And I think I was, I don't know, 12 or 13 years old. And I got a couple of pigeons. And, mm. and I always had this connection. You know, I don't know if it's cultural or what. Of course, right. Egyptians oh, have I'm been sure. eating pigeons for Absolutely. thousands and thousands right. of years. But um, I saw this opportunity here mm. because there's... There's always people going, oh, I wish, you know, I wish there was a place that we could buy hammam. And, mm. you know, I never know where to go to buy it. So I just started researching it. Right. And I thought, yeah, you know, maybe this is an opportunity to do something just on the side. Mm. So I ended up uh, buying a property and starting to raise squab mm. and then turned it bigger and bigger and bigger. And then it just turned into a real business. Mm. And, uh, you know, initially we were just selling to the churches and right. to the monastery. Mm. And then I thought, well, you know, there's there's a lot more than just Coptic Egyptians and that mm -hmm. want to eat this. And, you right. know, this Please. is this is an Egyptian <laughs> thing. It's for all of us, right? It's right. not exclusive to Absolutely. one religion or the other. Right. So I started approaching the halal butchers. That's and, amazing. of course, our, one of our biggest customers is right here, That's Belody amazing. Poultry. Yes. And, yeah, yes. I mean, they, yeah. they're one of our biggest customers. And Wonderful. then Live Poultry in Van Nuys. And there's one in downtown. They're all owned by Egyptians. And, Wonderful. And they're all halal butchers. So, of course, you know, that cross it's cross-cultural because it's sure. it's yeah. definitely the best way to butcher yeah. so any animal yeah you're definitely you know checking the mark on you know being a culturally appropriate for the egyptian community but yeah. also it's a great business opportunity we wish you really it's the just best more fun life. than it is right oh I'm a sure. great it's business not, opportunity. You know, sure, i mean comparing it to diamond i'm sure this is sure, a, yeah, a lost yeah. business but yeah. you know you also don't want to lose that's the thing about being a business absolutely man. i mean you don't want to go into something with you know with that with it being a loss i mean it at least can cover its cost absolutely but yes, also yeah. you know and we keep scaling it up right. i mean we just we just uh made a deal uh i think Jeez, I, Monday. It was Monday that we just bought out the third largest producer Wonderful. of squab in California. It was That's up in uh, Congratulations. Middle Cal uh, Central California. Yeah, it's so just we're, that, you know, the fact that life is full of opportunities. Same with the ranch that you bought uh, in Palm Springs. I mean, I've seen pictures and you promised yeah. me to take me to, to where it's will. called Lucy, Palm, Lucy Ranch, I believe. I, Lazy Sea. Lazy, Lazy Sea Ranch. Yeah, I was kind of yeah. Googling it. And, and you turn that ranch into, like, you kind of, I mean, tell us a little bit about this ranch and what it became and and again from, so, from a yeah. cultural I mean you did the same thing for keeping it the cultural like the American culture in it but also created a business opportunity for yourself yeah so this this was one of my um, you know I mentioned to you I'm, I'm constantly scouring you know for Coffee real estate and, deals right. and, and so this was an opportunity that came up and it was right during the Great Recession when mm -hmm. everything was just you know, devastated. Sure. Yes. And so this was a property that uh, the owner had, you know, had it and basically couldn't couldn't handle it anymore. Mm -hmm. So I ended up buying this property and it's a very historic property because it's actually on the Pacific Crest Trail mm -hmm. and it was a 
a stagecoach stop for oh, stagecoaches okay. that were going from, you know, whether oh. Mexico up to Washington State or whatever. Right. This was a stop where they would rest their horses and there was a natural watering hole mm -hmm. where they could, you know, get the horses water and feed them sure. and things like that. And uh, then later on, they turned it into, after obviously the stagecoaches stopped coming mm -hmm. when, you know, cars were invented. So they turned it into a dude ranch. Oh, okay. And this was in eight, 1920. They okay. turned it into a dude ranch. And then, of course, it fell into disrepair. For sure, yes. And so I got it. And, you know, it's interesting. I have partners in a lot of things that I do. But in mm -hmm. this one, they were just like, oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't want anything to do with this one. Too, it was just such, it was right. really a big project that, you know, there's 10 houses on the property. Mm. All of them were built between 1920 and 1940. So they were all in disrepair. Mm. And so we, you know, I bought it and started renovating it and I would just mm -hmm. go there and and it was just uh, all the pressure away from LA from my diamond business from my real estate business mm. this was a place for me to just go and create mm. artistically to turn this place into its origins mm. so what I did is I started thinking okay what does the old west look like and how should this place look if I was in a stagecoach thinking, what are all the things that I want to see mm -hmm. if I go into this town called Lazy Sea? Right. And so I ended up building like an entire town, town like a ghost town with yes. a bank. You know, it's, it's all right. it's not all real, yeah, but it's, right, it's right. a facade like, you know, right. like when you go to Knott's Berry Farm and you mm -hmm. see an old town. So there's a bank and there's an actual saloon. That mm -hmm. saloon is real. You can actually walk in there wow. and, uh, you know, for weddings and things like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And there's a you know, a, a jail and a hotel with a second story. Is and there any movies balcony. been filmed oh, yeah, there? Yeah, yeah. yeah we, get, we get film sets. Yeah. But what I was really doing was trying to create a place where people can escape from L.A. Mm. and go into this place that just, you just, just you know, you just lose all of your worries. Yeah, so it was kind of like an artistic endeavor. And it's also very much an artistic endeavor. restoration, I mean, as an archivist at heart. And then what was, ended up happening is that it became a place where people want to have weddings. Mm. I know your your daughter's and, wedding. We're going to talk a yeah, little bit about yeah. your two kids right now. So, so little by little, as yeah. I started to restore the houses and people were coming to vacation for mm. weekends and, you know, they started asking, oh, do you guys hold events here? And mm. we started building venues, you know, right. buildings and structures to host house, you know, events. And mm. and now primarily it's, it's a venue for weddings. So, mm. you know, we stage weddings almost every month and That's then there's incredible. you know I just love the corporate way retreats yeah. and coachella mm. concerts oh, and things sure. like that's yeah. a big oh, thing so i'm for sure that. a lot of people just come and, and rest and, but more than anything yeah. it's just my happy place yeah it's, oh, because so i have horses, horses yes. and i have goats i raise goats and sheep and chickens and ducks and and uh you know i actually raise horses uh Frisian horses oh, okay. that are show horses right. now. Yeah. And so we have beautiful black, you know, magnificent looking horses and That's some amazing. Arabians. Yeah, yeah. I want to go back to, because you said goats and you did share with me a little secret because, you know, going back about this idea of, of that kids that are especially raised in America or really teenagers anywhere in the world when we're so scared when they're like or like and we're very scared and but 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 we know that we've instilled something in their heart you know you take them to to friday prayer or sunday church mm -hmm. or sunday school you, and you consistently and so i've been all you say something and it goes on the from the other ear right but it really doesn't because you doesn't. came back full circle and you did mention something about all those goats that you enjoy seeing but then you <laughs> called someone and said I can give those away. Can tell me a little bit about the charity that you uh, ended up, you know, mm. doing, especially with the, you know, Coptic orphanages here in LA. And I know you're involved in many charities, but especially, you know, that connection that you have now with the Coptic Church is very, very admirable. Sure. Yeah, I don't really talk about things that I, you know, the charity, but, you know, the, the goats and the sheep are just kind of a cute little thing that mm. I do because. We only have goats and sheep because kids love them. Right. So the most happy thing to see is a little child mm -hmm. that their eyes just, you know, 
come to life when they see a little tiny baby goat mm. or a little tiny lamb. Right. And so we, we started with, you know, six or seven goats and six or seven sheep, and then they just keep reproducing. Sure. And of course, you know, I thought, okay, well, obviously, you know, I'm not a vegan or a vegetarian, so I mean, obviously this is great right. meat. Yeah. So we, we started, uh, and, and by the way, as I mentioned, the, the, the Coptic monastery was a big customer of mine for mm -hmm. the, for the, uh, the pigeons, the, pid, the squab, mm -hmm. the pigeon. And so I, I started telling them, oh, you know, I have all these goats and sheep. And mm. they said, oh, you know, we, you know, yeah, we'd love to buy, you know, we'd love to buy some. And I said, yeah, that's okay. We're, we're going to, so we, we would start, you know, we would just donate like whatever we had. And mm. some it got up to like 20, 30, 40, mm. you know, every, every year. And so it's a big support for them because right. what they do is they, we do butcher them for them. For and then sure. they take yes. the meat and then they sell it. Yeah. And so of course, I'm, I'm a big, money. I'm a big supporter of uh, Coptic orphans. I love that. Mm -hmm. I love what they do because they are not just giving money to people. What they're doing is giving them an education, giving them a path mm -hmm. to independence, which I truly, I just love their mission statement. That's amazing. And Hermin, Nermeen does such a great job mm -hmm. with that organization. Is it based in LA? No, they're based in Washington, oh, but they have okay. chapters everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah, I yeah. did hear about it a couple yeah. of times. It's a wonderful organization. Yeah, that's you know, a lot of these organizations, you know, they just funnel kids and then they, they create dependency. But right. what they're doing is the opposite. They're mm -hmm. creating independence by, yeah. you know, giving them a way to, to make a living. And I'm sure having your own kids, mashallah, now they have, they're 30 and 20, correct me if I'm yeah, wrong. Yeah, my daughter's, my daughter Andrea is 28, mm. and, then and my son Alec, I'm sorry, my daughter is 30. Okay, yes, good, she'll be Andrea. happy. Andrea, <laughs> and then my son, yeah, my son is uh, Alexander, <laughs> nice. he's 28, and if you put the two names together, it's Alexandria, Yeah. which is, beautiful. I named them after yeah, where I'm from. Yeah, Alex and Andrea, so yeah. tell me a little bit about them, I know um, uh, Andrea is the one that just had her wedding maybe a, a year or two ago yeah she actually came to me yeah. with her fiance and they said you know we've thought about this and we thought about doing destination weddings and we were talking about doing jamaica or this and that but you know we just really we just want to have it at the ranch mm. and i said okay sure. yes. <laughs> I mean, it's beautiful you know there's are you sure i mean you could do it anywhere in the world and she's like i don't i don't want to do it anywhere in the world this right. is the place that she grew up riding horses too, so mm -hmm. I think she loves that place as much as I do. Right. And we put on just the most wonderful wedding there. It was just full of love and right. and. Yeah. So you did tell me that she did. She ended up not marrying an Egyptian, but you wouldn't have chosen a better man for her than her her husband. Yes. How again? The, the struggle that you gave to your mom. So I'm sure you. I'm going to tell you well. interestingly. Both of my kids mm -hmm. who are half American mm. and half Egyptian. Right. If you ask them what they are, they will tell you we're Egyptian. Wow. My kids um, are the same way too. Where they, are you? Where are you Egyptian. from Egypt? I mean, yeah. you live in Lake Forest, California. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're Egyptian. Yeah. yeah, I mean that's just immediately that's right. that's what they that's what they feel inside them. That's how they grew up. They're wow. surrounded by Egyptian family members right. celebrating Egyptian holidays and mm. in addition to American holidays. But my daughter married an American. Mm. Um, and he is wonderful mm. and he is a man <laughs> he has brought out thing. the best in her mm. he loves her and she loves him and that's really all you can ask for as a parent mm. is, is that he embracing you... of the egyptian culture the strong oh, he loves egyptian. it okay. he loves it sure are you he kidding loves the food and he, he loves it he loves everything yeah. about it yeah what advice did you give your daughter when she got married I gave my, advi my advice to my daughter well before she got married. Mm. I've been giving advice? her advice like, nonstop. What's the most important thing for, for a dad to tell his daughter? You know, as she's growing up, you know, I, I shared with you, I have a 12 years old daughter, so I'm always kind of, you know, stealing ideas and seeking advice. So this is really a, a personal question, but... Um, I'm sure a lot of people are, you know, would like to benefit how to raise a beautiful daughter like Andrea yeah. to be independent and think for herself and, and all that. I would say the most important thing that I told her is respect yourself mm. and respect 
your culture right and your heritage and your family mm. find what you want to do in life right and because if you find something that you feel passionate about mm -hmm. it's not even work right it's just joy huh. right and of course there were many hiccups along the way For sure. because my daughter was rebellious just mm -hmm. as i was mm -hmm. my son was too they, sure. they gave it back to me yeah you know I, yeah. I got what i deserved yeah i'm sure your mom is looking at us absolutely now and, and there's laughing. no question yes. about that no question about that but i would say those are the things that i advised her of my daughter is very um she's a fascinating person she's very artistic mm. she took after her grandmother for she became a chef oh okay so skipped a generation Amazing. i wanted nothing to do with food wow. she went straight into food and she went to culinary arts school That's went to work for four seasons and then um when she decided to reunite with brad because mm. he's a um He's an engineer, and mm. so he got a job with Caltrans. Right. So she went to a place called Bishop, mm. and the best job that she could find was she was running, she's running the school program, mm. the food wonderful. program. Yeah, so but she's also an entrepreneur. So right. she's, got, she's got a business selling uh, organic soaps and candles, mm. and then she does private Catering. chefing. You know, she Amazing. chefs as uh, private so she engagements. she has the best of all worlds. The She's doing it all. Your mom, your, that's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. So tell me a little bit about Alex. I know he's engaged to a beautiful Palestinian young girl. Yes. They're yeah. getting ready to also get married yes, soon. Yeah. So tell me a, so a little Alex bit about is, that. So um, Alex uh, is working with me. Okay. And so I'm thrilled about that, of mm -hmm, course, mm -hmm. because what Was it what his more? choice? Or? Oh, absolutely it was nice. his choice. Good. I did not push him at an, nice. in any way. He initially was veering towards jewelry, mm -hmm. but I kind of redirected him to real estate okay. because I felt that my real estate business had much more growth potential than jewelry. Jewelry is a very tough business in mm -hmm. America. It's very competitive. It's very cutthroat. It is a tough, tough business. Sure. Yeah. And of all those things that I experienced in my life, I saw why go push him to the to the business that's mm. so limited and so severe sure. as opposed to this wide-ranging, you know, unlimited opportunity. So I did push him towards that. Um, and then he took over marketing. Mm. So he's uh, the director of marketing, but he's also in charge of acquisitions mm. uh, for the company. And now, mm. as he's mastered that, I'm beginning to, he's requested several times you know mm. dad what can i do to help you with jewelry right i really want him that's like it's it's in his dna right because he grew up well before i ever publicly said i'm getting heavier and heavier into in real jewelry. estate yeah and it greatly surpassed my my jewelry and diamond business mm. he always felt you know i'm the son of a jeweler i'm oh, the son of a diamond oh, guy I i'm the see. son of a diamond guy yeah that's and amazing. of course you know all of my events and the shows are always as he was growing up, he, you know, he felt like his, they yeah. were, his family it's was in the diamond business. It's funny how we all end up being our parents. You know, there was this, uh, I'll share this article with you. I'm sure you'll appreciate it. Uh, you know, 20 things I swore I won't do as my parents, and I ended up doing all of them. Sure. It's a brilliant article. It's like, you, you know, eat your vegetables. Don't do the, you know, all these, especially yes. with Egyptian parents, we all have, like, specific standard things that we say to our kids, whether it's correct or not. Um, so it looks like, you know, again, they, they also rebelled against you. Sure. You're also... Yep you know, trying to get them to, to work with you and all that stuff. But you personally also became your mother. Uh, you know, you shared with me how, <laughs> you, how close you are to all the nieces and nephews and all the Yeah, no, that's generation. absolutely true. That's, that's yeah. a great point because at my mother's, uh, at my mother's um, funeral, mm -hmm. you know, there were so many people that she touched mm -hmm. that we reached out to all those people people through Facebook. Many of them are in different countries now. Mm. You know, as I mentioned, some were going to university here, some were just, you know, here and then they transitioned to some other place. But they never lost touch with her. Mm. You know, she was again their second mom. Sure. So in the videos, because not everybody was able to come, so you know, we said, Oh, just make a video and you know, we'll put it together and mm. I would say eighty to ninety percent of the people that 
made a video mm. to commemorate her, said she was my second mom, and then they would mm. tell a story. And it never really hit me that in many regards that I'm a second dad to mm. so many to people. Many of those people. That yeah. whether they're family or not, you know, mm. they're, they're sometimes they're not family at all, but they've always come to me as a person that gets it. Mm. And some of these people may have, you know, parents that came to America much later. And they're, they're asking my advice on how to, how do I deal with, um, you know, the situation? What do I tell my parents? How do I deal with this issue? Mm. And so it's funny you say I became, yes, it's, it's true. I became a second yeah. dad Again, to so many people. Again, I have that visual, people. you know, representation in my head of your mom. And she reminds me, even though I haven't seen her, but just from the stories that I heard about Loris, the owner of Sabrina, she reminds me of uh, Maya Angelou's famous quote is that it's not what you do for people, it's how you make them feel. No, um, question, and no I'm, question and it, it. does it does no seem that you are that. also, um, you know, the, the same way because, um, you know, this is the first time you and I meet in person and you've made me feel very welcome and uh, embraced it's mutual, the, the, the show way. and it's, it's really Thank exciting. You. So um, it, it's hard to cut conversations that are very interesting and, you know, but, but our time is up uh, and it's hard to believe that an hour have has, it passed already? has it passed already, <laughs> but we've had, I've had such a pleasure getting to know you and your story. Thank you. Uh, but I want to ask you my last and traditional questions, which what is Egypt to you in just a word or two or a few words or a sentence? What is Egypt to you? Where is Egypt in your life? Um, That's a good question. I would say it's my identity, it's my pride, um, it's much more than a heritage, it's, uh, it's in my DNA. Mm. And all those things that I got from my parents that I may have rebelled at, like you said, it goes full circle. Mm. That culture never leaves you. Yeah. It's, it's all encompassing. Right. It's a source of pride, it's a source of dignity, it's a source of everything. I love that, dignity and DNA, and as there's a famous quote, you can take an Egyptian out of Egypt, but you can't take Egypt out of any Egyptian. So Yeah, like they say, it's yeah. the mother of the world, it right? It is the Omid, mother of the Omid world. Omid Dunya. Ya Rabbi yeah. Omid Dunya, and uh, uh, Chad, it's been a pleasure getting to know you. Pleasure's uh, you mine. Know, Zoom, in person. Thank you for honoring me and giving me the chance to tell your story. Uh, and you know, wish you the best of luck. Thank you so much, yeah, Shasha. You're very, very welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much.